What's the big deal, deal? Where can you get pizza, bread twists, specialty chicken, and more for just five ninety nine each? Is it at Domino's? He hands off hand toss pizza and a marble cookie brownie. He's going, going, go! There's a lot of variety on the radio and at Domino's too, where you can. Two item minimum pan pizza, bone and wings, and bread bowls will be extra. Ask for this limited time offer. Prices, participation, delivery area, and charges may vary. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson. Here on the Hump Day edition of the Yard, it's National Signing Day. Doesn't mean what it used to mean. Matter of fact, it'll be an awfully quiet day for Mississippi State. They'll announce Caden Pope, and they'll announce uh, Xavier Thomas today. And there's never been any anxiety or concern about their announcements today because, uh, you know, signings have uh, basically been facilitated. We're just kind of waiting uh, for the announcement. But, um, you know, speaking of announcements, there, uh, there's a good, it's a good day. I got a call yesterday. Those, many of you have uh, followed my work for years, and I thank you for that. I've always wanted to write books. And I shared that recently on Facebook. You know, when uh, I, had a, I had a life coach for a while, uh, courtesy of a company that I worked for before I went uh, full-time with you guys. And uh, so I got, you know, I got Brad, uh, you know, I guess once a quarter or so, and we would talk. And one of the things that he said one day that kind of offended me, and he goes, you know, Steve, you're, uh, you're, you're leading an accidental life. I was offended. You know, here I was at the top of my field with the top of my company, making more money than I had ever made, providing like I never had before. But I'd kind of stopped being me along the way. You know, I'd become dad and become a husband. And, you know, it's like all these things were going on. And I was basically a facilitator for other people. And he said, you know, what are your goals? And I, you know, I rattled off a bunch of cliche stuff. And I was like, well, you know, this. And he goes, you know, you didn't, you mentioned all these great things you want to do for everybody else. What do you want to do for you? I didn't have an answer. He goes, well, tell me one thing you want to do before you die. And I said, well, I want to write a book. And I'll be honest with you, there were times that the fear of never accomplishing that goal really kind of crippled me. There were sometimes I'd be out on the road, sometimes by myself, and you know, I was a regional manager with a lending company, and I'd ride around, and I would think, you know, this isn't what I was born to do. I mean, yeah, I'm making great money, and, you know, we're having some success, but at the end of the day, it wasn't very fulfilling for me. So I wanted to write books, and I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to lay in my deathbed someday with all of my loved ones around my bedside telling me how much they love me, and I'm going to sit there and lament the fact that I never wrote a book. And so I wanted to write books, didn't know how to go about it, started really forecasting that in my life. Hey, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to write a book. And, you know, I'd start a book, I, I would stop. I, I just didn't know how to go about it. And then, of course, things happened, and I had a lit- literary agent reach out to me during the, uh, you know, the, the, the Hugh Free stuff. And it said, hey, there's going to be books written about all this stuff. You're the guy to write it. Would you be willing to do it? I didn't respond for a month. And a lot of it was because uh, I was pretty content kind of doing what I was doing. I was happy, you know, just covering recruiting on Gene's page and kind of doing some team coverage stuff. And I was, I was just good doing that. I was good doing this show for you guys. I'd go over to the Bulldog Sports Radio studio and you know, sit down with Brian Haydad, and I'd, I'd share what I knew and what I thought, and you guys liked it. And uh, eventually I said, well, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll write the book. Well, number five is on its way, and that's literally and figuratively. Uh, got the call yesterday that Dogpile is on a truck headed to Mississippi. It is expected to arrive on Thursday. And just so you guys know, too, we understand that uh, – the demand for this book is going to be incredible. We've already pre-sold thousands of books. And um, so the second printing has actually already been ordered too. That'll be here later in the spring. All that's been taken care of. But uh, the first printing is going to arrive Thursday, sometime Thursday. So we'll get you know, more information. And so I'm going to be exceptionally busy uh, for the next several days. We're still going to do a Friday show. That's always going to happen. But it's finally here. And uh, so for those of you that pre-ordered, here's how this is going to work. I'm going to go out. The books are going to be here Thursday. I'm going to actually start signing books Thursday night. We'll do some of that then. 
we're going to sign books on Friday, and then uh, we'll, we'll sign books Saturday, and then I will sign the remainder of them on Sunday. And so then your pre-ordered books will get in the mail uh, Monday. There may be a slight chance that a few get into the book into the mail on, on Friday. I can't make you those guarantees. And there's already been a pretty exhaustive schedule put together for me. So we're going to go from basically, you know, zero to 100 in less than a week's time. I just kind of been sitting around waiting for these things to happen. And so we're going to have the book launch Friday evening. Let me give you the signing schedule. And uh, many of you I know have loved to come to book signings, that sort of stuff. I'm going to be in your neck of the woods at some point. I may have to miss some baseball games. I don't want to have to do that, but that may be what we have to do. You know, we wanted to get all this stuff done uh, during the Christmas season, but uh, life didn't work out the way that we expected, you know. So so let's uh, – Let's take a quick look at this. So here is what we have right now. So the first book signing will take place this Friday in downtown Starkville at Book Martin Cafe from 3 to 6. That's the official book launch party. Saturday, February 5th, I will be at Campus Book Mart from 12 to 4. Wednesday, February 9th, that's a week from today, I will be in Meridian, Mississippi at the Bulldog Shop. You guys are familiar with that probably go have uh have some uh plate lunch over at Whiteman's too while I'm there Thursday February 10th I'll be doing a uh I guess a virtual thing and an in-person thing uh, at the Starkville Library from noon until one that evening Thursday February 10th I will be in Greenwood Mississippi at Turn Row Books excited to see all our friends in the Mississippi Delta Friday February 11th I'll be at Maroon and Company from three to six that Saturday, February 12th, I will be at Lemuria Books in Jackson from noon until 2. And then that afternoon, I will be at Persnickety in Madison from 3 to 5. And so a lot is going on and a lot is going to happen very, very quickly. Uh, I'm really excited about the book, and I'll be honest with you, I get a little emotional sometimes thinking about all this stuff. I worked exceptionally hard on this, and I know this is also a very, very special time in your life and not just my life. Um, it documents the first ever team NAFL championship in Mississippi State history. And so in many respects, I feel like this is something that has been like a labor of love my entire life. I've always wanted to write this book, and I get the chance to do it. And, and you, you guys who follow me on social media know, like as soon as the ball game went final, as soon as it was over, and we had eliminated Vanderbilt, I tweeted out immediately that the writing process for a book about chronicle in the NAFL championship season the writing process would begin immediately it did as soon as I got back we began to have some meetings I went to work uh, I basically wrote this thing in about eight weeks it usually takes me about six months so I'm going to ask you for a little bit of grace even though we have heavily edited this book I probably made a mistake or two along the way please don't think any less of me but if you find those mistakes feel free to email me at srobertson at jeanspage.com so I can research that and ensure that we get it right. So if we have to correct something in subsequent printings, we can. Uh, you know, that's the thing that I've learned is to be patient with myself. Five books in, you know, no matter how long, or how extensive, or how many times they're edited, there's always something that I wish I would have done a little bit different. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Matter of fact, I had somebody message me just yesterday that uh, had read Alpha Dogs and um, thought that I had falsely attributed a hometown to a former Bulldog player and come to find out we were talking about two different people. Uh, so I was right. They were wrong. And that's not, you know, to be haughty or anything. But I get those messages from time to time. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. So, and if we have made mistakes, we'll, we'll correct them. I know in Flim Flam I made – I attributed some high schools incorrectly to some players. And, and uh, that kind of stuff irritates me because that's facts. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's easy to fix. But you learn and evolve over this process. And um, so Dogpile – is on its way. I can't wait to hold that book in my hands. And so what I wanted to do today to kind of prime the pump a little bit, you know, if you hadn't ordered, you can at dogpiledabook.com or you can order through your local bookstore. Um, I wanted to read you guys the introduction, if that's okay, if you'll indulge me a little bit. It's not very long, uh, but I wanted to read you the introduction to the book. This is the longest book that I have ever written. Um, it also has color pictures. You know, it, it I wrote the longest book in the shortest amount of time and uh, basically worked about 18 hours a day, six days a week, 
uh, for eight weeks. I guess the, the raw writing process went about six, and we spent a couple weeks kind of working through, you know, some rewrites and changes and things like that. And so it was exhausting. I did everything that I could to get this book to you by Christmas. It didn't work out. And it makes me angry, but it's one of those things, you know, who, who, who can you be upset with? Well, I mean, you know, you can find plenty of people to assign blame to, you know, but the bottom line is we delivered the book well ahead of schedule and the printer just couldn't meet, you know, the deadline. As a matter of fact, they pushed it back twice. And so, you know, here we are, but it's finally here. So without any further ado, because we've got a great show to talk about today. I'm going to read you the introduction. I, this may be the final copy. I might have tweaked it a little bit, but this is just kind of what I have saved on my, uh, on my computer, uh, labeled as Intro to Dogpile. And so I, I want to share that with you to kind of let you know uh, what to expect. All right, so here we go, the introduction to Dogpile. I have always written, I have always loved Mississippi State. Back in 2001, I got the opportunity to write about Mississippi State and get paid for it. Gene Swindoll hired me back then for the King's Ransom of $50 an article. My weekly column, The Robertson Report, at its core was a pick'em piece. It was a part-time gig for me, but I loved doing it. In time, my role on jeanspage.com expanded. I got involved with our football recruiting coverage. I learned to love that too. My competitive nature and desire to break news worked out well for the site and our subscribers. After several years of covering the Bulldogs in Baton Rouge, I finally had the chance to move to Starkville. Once on site, I began to assist in covering Mississippi State in all sports full-time. I have always had a love affair with baseball. The college game has always held my attention. There is a purity to college baseball. The Diamond Dogs always seem to be in contention for something, so every year seems special. At Mississippi State, there is always something to play for. Back in 2016, I covered my first baseball road series as the Bulldogs traveled to both Alabama and Auburn. Providing road coverage is a different animal. There's travel, hotels, a lot of windshield time. I took to it. I love being the eyes and ears of the Bulldog fans back home. When the 2019 college baseball season rolled around, Jake Mangum was chasing the SEC hitch record. I decided early on that I would stay on the road until Mangum surpassed LSU slugger Eddie Furness. Jake's record-breaking quest took us both a lot of new places. I was there when Jake and the boys took a huge road series from Florida. Mangum even hit a home run that weekend in Gainesville. Mangum caught Jeffrey Ray in a Mississippi State school hits record at Tennessee three weekends later. I was the only member of the media there. Jake's one-on-one video interview with me went viral. We had a forgettable weekend in Fayetteville. Jake had just two hits in the three games. While the result was unpleasing, it set the stage for Mangum to break the SEC record at home in front of our fans at Duty Noble Field. In a private conversation, Jake shared with me that he always knew the record-breaking hit would come at home. It was only fitting. A weekend series against Georgia provided the backdrop as Mangum became the SEC hits king. I had a decision to make after that. With the SEC hits record secured, I could stay home. But the truth of the matter is I was having so much fun, I just couldn't do it. I followed the Bulldogs all the way to Omaha Omaha for the first time in my life. The College World Series has always been important to me, but I simply hadn't been able to make the trip before. As Michigan and Texas Tech took the field for the first game of the 2019 College World Series, Motley Crue's Kickstart My Heart played. I have heard that song hundreds of times, but it simply sounded different in Omaha. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. There was no place in the world I would have rather been. While State was eliminated before the finals that week, I hung out for a couple more days to take it all in. I spent a day off in Omaha seeing the sights and eating at all the places I had only heard about. I had a ball. I decided then I would make the trip to the College World Series every time the Bulldogs did for the rest of my life. I have since told my daughters not to plan any June weddings. If the Bulldogs are in Omaha, then that's where I will be. As the 2021 season began, I believe Mississippi State was capable of getting back to the College World Series for the third straight time. That feat had never been accomplished before in program history. I told my publisher back in early spring that the Bulldogs won the College World Series. I wanted to write this book. As a product of my confidence, I saved every interview from every game this entire season. As fate would have it, the Diamond Dogs did win the first team national title in Mississippi State history. 
Thankfully, I was more than prepared to chronicle this magical season for all generations of Bulldogs and for those still to come. It has been one of the greatest joys of my life to cover this team and write this book. Dogpile makes number five for me. They're all special to me, but perhaps this one a little more so. I have waited my entire life to write it. Late in the season, lifelong Mississippi State fan Stan Horton of Ripley, Mississippi passed away unexpectedly. Stan was a diehard bulldog and a friend to me on social media. I never met the man in person, but in some way I felt like I had. The tragic nature of his passing stays with me. I was fortunate enough to meet his family. They are good people. They are good bulldogs. I decided then that I was going to dedicate every article I wrote the rest of the 2021 baseball season to Stan's memory. I did. With that in mind, I would like to dedicate this book to Stan and to all of the Bulldogs who did not live long enough to see Mississippi State be crowned national champions. While they were not with us to celebrate, I feel like they know. Perhaps they may have even had a hand in it. As I sit here now typing these words, I feel it is important that we recognize that this is our first national title. It will not be our last. When those glorious days come, I hope to be alive to write about them too. Until that day comes, we will celebrate and honor the 2021 NAFL Championship is one of the greatest moments in our lives. Hail State. So that's how we kick it off. And uh, I, I, I think that you're going to enjoy this book probably, probably for years to come. I hope it's something that you always cherish. As I told you, it's been an absolute labor of love. And uh, I can't wait to hold the book in my hands. And I can't wait to get out there on the road and, uh, and visit with some of you all. And then I can't wait to hear your reviews. That's an exciting time in all of this. And so, so there you go. Dogpile now officially printed and shipped and will soon be in your hands. Let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. I love them too. I've had a love affair with Bulldog Burger Company basically since the first time I went there and sat down. I remember where I sat, which is kind of weird, but I do. I remember where I sat. I had the Bulldog Burger. I thought, you know what? This place is going to make it. It's a great location. The quality of the food is outstanding. The service is great. Not too pricey. There are a lot of places out there that are charging a little bit more and giving you a little bit less. That's not the case at Bulldog Burger Company. Absolutely doing the best job. Selling restaurant quality hamburgers in this neck of the woods. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive right here in Star Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, and the brand new one, Lake Harbor Drive there in the Ridge and Flowood area. Go in, have the spring rolls. They'll make you and everybody around you better looking. We always need, we all need more of that. And if you're like me, you know, maybe you're like, hey, Steve, you know, I've had a lot of hamburgers in my day, but I've never had my hamburger. I've never found my signature burger. Well, you got a lot of options. Mine is the Pimentology Add Bacon. That'll put some hair on your chest right there now. That's a serious, serious hamburger. Go by, check it out. Find your own favorites, but maybe take the Boneyard Bulldog Burger Challenge. I have had them all. We, I never ranked them because it kind of depends on what mood I'm in. You know what I'm saying? Like one day the smokehouse tastes like the greatest thing I've ever had. Then the next time I go, it's a, it's a different one. And that's a great thing is the variety you have. And maybe you're not feeling like a burger today. Have the sweet heat chicken sandwich. Have the sloppy joe sliders. They've got something that will cure your appetite. Absolutely. No matter where you go, where you're from, what you do for a living, you're going to find a quality meal at Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, let's talk Mississippi State men's basketball. Bulldogs won big last night. Now, a couple of disclaimers before we get started. Okay, I understand, oh, well, it's just South Carolina. You know, the South Carolina had won three in a row, including a road game at Texas A&M. Okay, when I watched us play the ball game last night, I thought we clearly looked to be the more athletic and talented team. And so it gave me some hope to think, hey, well, we got a really good chance to go win at Colonial Life, too. You know, we talked about how important it is. We, you know, we probably need to sweep South Carolina, Missouri, and, of course, beat Vanderbilt and then pick up a couple wins somewhere else, you know, against some other teams that are vying for an NCAA tournament berth uh, to put ourselves in a position to make the tournament. I remain optimistic about that. I'm probably not as optimistic as I was a couple weeks ago, but I still believe we are tournament worthy. I believe maybe we haven't played our best basketball yet. Uh, still listed uh, first four out. We got a chance to play our way in. But last night, the thing that I will tell you right out of the gate, 
I thought we played with some ferocity that we haven't seen as of late. I firmly believe that Mississippi State was embarrassed at Texas Tech, and Texas Tech picked up a big win last night over Texas. I mean, this Texas Tech team is really good, and this probably isn't even a hot take. I think they're the best team we've played. Now, I've seen Auburn play a few times, and they're going to be a handful. I'm glad we only play them once. But this Texas Tech team is good. But I think this Mississippi State team responded well last night. They got really punched in the mouth on Saturday. You know, we had that emotional game that went to overtime against Kentucky. I think that took an emotional toll on us. But also, too, I think we played a better basketball team on Saturday, and we got beat. And it was very – I think it's humbling. You know, when, when you think, okay, we're a tournament team, and you go down there, and they pretty much took the fight to us. I thought last night Mississippi State took the fight to South Carolina – we coasted a little bit late. And I don't like to see that, uh, but the reality of it is, you know, the, the lead was so expansive at that point, it didn't really matter. But I'd like to see what we could do, you know, with a full 40 minutes, you know, if we really were engaged for 40 minutes. But the bottom line is we win the game. And some would say, well, you know, what does that really change? Well, it doesn't change anything. But it's better than the alternative. If we had lost to South Carolina, we would really be in a deep hole right now. We have basically no margin for error right now. And so you have to win the games that you're expected to win. We did last night. And I know that some people, too, it's like, and I hate to say it this way, but this is just kind of the perception. Maybe I'm wrong, and if you're one of these people, maybe message me and correct me. But I get the sense that some people are so ready for a coaching change, they're almost rooting against a team. That's a bad spot to be in. You can say, well, Steve, I just feel like, you know, coaching change is probably better for the future. And you know what? Maybe you're right. You know, but I think, why not just root for what we have right now? Do I think Ben Howland is uh, in a strong position right now? No, I don't. But I, as I mentioned earlier in the week, sometimes I think Ben Howland has been at his best at Mississippi State when the backs are against the wall. There have been times we say, oh, we're not going to win this one. And then we do. We come out and play well. We've got a superstar in Iverson Molinar. Uh, and I thought Garrison Brooks was outstanding. Garrison, I thought, was really one of those guys in Lubbock that kind of took the brunt of the beating. I thought Texas Tech kind of beat him up. He comes out last night and has uh, arguably his best game in the Mississippi State uniform. So happy about that. Let's kind of look at some of this stuff, kind of break it down. Of course, State, a 45-23 lead at the break. And you just kind of felt like then that South Carolina was never going to be able to challenge. I thought State's effort on the defensive end was outstanding. There were times, and I don't know who counts the turnovers, but it seemed like to me that every time South Carolina wanted to do something, it was just an absolute struggle. And there were times they turned the ball over, and then I heard Jimmy Dyke say, well, it's had to six turnovers. I'm thinking, I don't know who's counting these, but it seems like every time that they get ready to make a cross-court pass, we have a hand in a passing lane. But I was encouraged last night. And again, oh, it's just South Carolina. You're right, it is. But it's a game we won. And so let's kind of look into this too. Second half, South Carolina wins 41-33. And, again, some of that's worth coasting. You know, and they started shooting bombs and running some sets, and uh, we're just trying to get the game over. And so, you know, again, you don't want to get anybody injured, and we nearly did, and just one of those freak things that happens. You know, Garrison Brooks goes down a little bit of a turned ankle, but he did return. I don't know that I would have put him back on the floor, to be honest with you, but, uh, you know, maybe perhaps he wanted to get out and go see if he could go and see how he, how he felt. Um, but, yeah, big game for Iverson Molinar, again, 20 points. Uh, again, he's not a prolific three-point shooter. He goes 0 for 2 uh, from beyond the arc, but 5 of 10 from the field and a perfect 10 of 10 at the line. We didn't do a good job of that Saturday. You know, we didn't get to the line. You know, when we got in the lane, we had to give it up or we forced up a bad shot. And so we did a better job of kind of attacking the rim, getting to the free throw line, and Iverson is pretty much automatic. You know, once he gets up there, he is one of the better free throw shooters in this conference. Uh, 20 points for him. Uh, pulls down three rebounds just to one personal foul. And if I remember correctly, I think it was even kind of a an iffy foul at that. Um, Garrison Brooks, you know, I mentioned, I, I really thought he came out with some fire. And we're going to need that from him. You know, especially once Tolu Smith comes back and you start thinking, well, now all of a sudden you get three viable scoring options on the floor, which will – enable Iverson Molinar to be even more effective. But Garrison Brooks played 30 minutes, 8 of 14 from the field, uh, 2 of 4 from the line, 9 rebounds, 18 points. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, 17 of those came in the first half. And so 
We didn't run as much for him in the second half. But he came out and I thought really set the tone against South Carolina. I think he I, I think he wanted this game and I think he needed to kind of get back in the flow. He did that. We need that from him, and I think he needed that game to kind of exert himself again. DJ Jeffries, a pretty solid game for him. 28 minutes of action, two of four from the from the floor. Uh, knocked down one three, five of six from the line. Had seven rebounds and ten points. That's a stat line we can all live with, right? That, that's a stat line that we'd like to see. You know, a couple free throws uh, here and there uh, in those tight ball games, you're going to need somebody besides Mo- uh, Molnar to knock them down. DJ also had five assists. Uh, Shaquille Moore, not much on the offensive end. And, and again, when you're, when you're getting scoring down in the post, you know, maybe you don't want to be quite so perimeter-oriented. Uh, but DJ Jeffries, I, I thought, kind of picked up the slack there. Shaquille, 24 minutes, uh, two of four, pulled down a couple of boards, just four points. Cam Matthews, again, not a prolific scorer, but every time I look up, I catch Cam Matthews doing the right thing. You know what I'm saying? It's like we talk about this all the time. There are so many things that don't show up in the box score that are impactful in a basketball game. And Cam Matthews is doing those things. He is one of the most agitating on-the-ball defenders that we have had in recent years. He is always in your face. He's got great length. And so, you know, you try to whip it around, the next thing you know, he's all up on you. He sets good picks. He plays good defense. Gets out there and rebounds. You know, he's never going to be a prolific scorer for us. And he's had some ball games where he's been double digits. But we don't need that from him. Anything that you get from him on the offensive end is a bonus. He is out there doing the grunt work. You know, I tell you who he reminds me of a little bit. He's not quite as long. You remember Russell Walters? You know, it's like that guy was a great scorer in high school too. You know, he transferred here from Alabama. And uh, But every time you looked up, he's the guy setting the big screen. He's the guy pulling the big rebound down. He's the guy up there. Uh, you know, getting in people's face and altering shots. You know, Cam Matthews has some of that in him. You know, Cam might actually be a little bit more athletic. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way because Walters obviously was a great player here at Mississippi State. But I see some of that same blue-collar work ethic, grinded-out type basketball mentality from Cam Matthews. So we pull a box score and I see Cam's only got two or three, two or three points. I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's fine. That's absolutely fine because Cam Matthews is an absolute irritant on the defensive end for opponents. And when you go up there and you're ready, you ready to box him out and, and battle for a rebound, you better bring a sack lunch. He pulled down seven boards, and even the ones he doesn't get, he's just one of those guys he makes you work so hard. And it grinds on you. And it wears you out. Uh, your best bench performer, without a doubt, Rocket Watts, and how good is it to see him start to get going too? Gives you another good scoring option off the bench. And I thought last night he was outstanding. Hit a couple of big threes. It really gave State a chance to expand the lead. 19 points for him. 19 minutes, excuse me. Four of eight from the field. Three of six. We were four of nine as a team. Rocky Watts made three of them. Maybe that's his game. Three rebounds, one assist, a couple turnovers. Also had a steal. 11 points for him. Derek Fountain came in. Uh, seven big bench points for him, too. And he is a role player for us. But uh, you probably need to see him get a few more minutes here and there. I think he helps keep DJ Jeffries fresh, too. Anderson Garcia, 12 minutes, uh, four points for him, and had three steals. One of the things about Anderson Garcia, too, I never see him leading us in scoring, but it seems like at least once a game he gets some huge emphatic basket, whether it be a big dunk or a putback or something where he's down there battling with the trees and, it just seems like he always does something that gives the team an emotional lift. Uh, Cam Carter, a little bit of action, too. Javian Davis, again, did not score, uh, but had some good minutes for us, uh, kind of in relief of, of Garrison Brooks. But it's a good win because it is an important win. You can say, well, Steve, it's not a big win. At this point in the year, everything is big for bubble teams. Every win is big. And so while the quality of competition is not what we faced last year, this is a South Carolina team that has played well as of late, and we very easily, if we had come in there and not played up to our potential, could have lost that ball game. And in all tense, for all intents and purposes, the bubble bursts. What's the big deal, deal? Where can you get pizza, bread twists, specialty chicken, and more for just five ninety nine each? Is it at Domino's? 
He hands off hand tossed pizza and a marble cookie brownie. He's going, going, going! There's a lot of variety on the radio and at Domino's too, where you can. Two item minimum pan pizza, bone and wings, and bread bowls will be extra. Ask for this limited time offer. Prices, participation, delivery area, and charges may vary. You lose to South Carolina, you're really, really up against it. Now, got some big games left. That road trip to Arkansas is going to be huge. Uh, does Tolu Smith come back? He didn't play last night. You know, he's still a week to week type deal. I haven't heard a time frame for a return. It's going to all be about how he responds to treatment. Do you need him to beat Arkansas? Probably. You know, we, we saw them the first time without Note, and we won that ball game, and it was a very competitive game. It was a big win for us at the time. Uh, so, does Tolu travel? I, I guess we'll find out on Thursday, and we may not know until game time. Just don't know. But in order for State to pick up a signature win somewhere or a win of importance, we're going to have to have Tolu Smith. And, and maybe sitting him – gets you closer to that just because it gets him healthier again it's just one of those wild and crazy things that have happened and I'll be honest with you with or without Tolu Smith last week you know we're probably at best looking at a split if he plays against Kentucky maybe 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 you pull that thing off but you know what maybe the guys around him his supporting cast elevated their game in his absence so you never really know how that's going to work down I, I don't know that we give up all those uh, offensive rebounds. I think Tolu at some point gets uh, gets his hands on a couple of those things. And in, an, in a, a game that ends in a tie in regulation, you never know how that's going to work out. But I don't know that it would have mattered against Texas Tech. I think they're just better than us. I, I really do. Um, but, you know, we'll see. You know, we have taken some really good teams to Bud Walton Arena and come home with a loss. But Ben Howland has had some pretty good success against Arkansas. And so we'll see how things shake loose. Again, you win – and then all of a sudden, you kind of look for the traffic to clear around you. Uh, kind of looking, too, at uh, some SEC basketball stuff. I, th- I think, you know, we, we, we're getting a little help, I guess, in some respects. You know, we're, you know, some of the teams around us are kind of hanging in there, too. Um, but we're getting – there's some teams right there behind us a little bit that we're, we're kind of beginning to gain some ground or separate a little bit. We're tied for fourth in the league with Arkansas at five and three right now. Arkansas has won six in a row, in case you hadn't been paying attention. Uh, Ole Miss takes care of LSU last night. That's good for us, too, because, you know, LSU's right there kind of similarly situated with us. But also, too, we've talked, too, on this show, but, you know, Kermit's another one of those guys, too, that um, he's such an emotional coach. He'll get his team up to beat somebody that you're not expecting, and I think last night is evidence of that. Uh, A&M has lost five in a row. You remember that a lot of people thought, hey, well, you know, people are sleeping on A&M. And then uh, Kentucky went in there and beat them. They have been in a, uh, a slide ever since. So, you know, we'll see how things progress with all of that. But, um, you know, we need a little help. We do. We could get some tonight. Uh, Florida's at Missouri. And you just never know. Any, anytime that you have to go to another team's home gym, you, you better be ready to go. Vanderbilt's at Kentucky. Arkansas is at Georgia, and so you would expect the chalk to hold here. Probably the only game you look at and say, you know, is a real toss-up in any respect is Florida-Missouri, but you got to give Florida the edge there. Missouri hadn't been a great team this year, and we need – it's a good year for us to play them twice because we're going to need both of those wins. Uh, looking back at last night, Tennessee, Tennessee 90-80 winners over a and Of course, State wins 78-64. Uh, Ole Miss 72 – excuse me, 76-72 win – in Baton Rouge. And maybe that gives us a little hope that we can go down there and do the same. That's a game, you know, earlier this week, I said, you know, that's going to be a tall task for us to go down there and play LSU. We're not really playing that well right now. And then, you know, Ole Miss goes in there and steals one. And as much as you hate to say it, that win is helpful for Mississippi State. Uh, Alabama, of course, uh, goes to Auburn. I don't know if you guys had a chance to watch that game. Auburn puts up 100 on Alabama. And good for you, Bruce. I I think rivalries are great for college sports. And I don't want to spend a lot of time belaboring this point. I thought the atmosphere in the jungle was incredible. And I like the students being close to the floor. And I think it's something we got – I think we need to look at that. And, And I say that for a couple different reasons. Sometimes we, our attendance is better than it appears on TV because we have people in the, in the upper deck, in the upper level. 
we have a lot of season ticket holders that don't, don't come to games regularly. And maybe that's like we just want the option. We want the option to be able to come to a game if we want to. So we're going to secure good tickets. And then they don't you know, transfer them to other people to make sure they're filled. That's fine. You can do what you want to with your tickets as long as you don't sell them to other fans, uh, rival fans, excuse me. Um, but I think we need to look at that. I mean, when I look at how much fun they're having at Auburn, and granted, it's easy to have fun when you've got the number one team in the country. But this has been building for a little while. And, and I, I'm going to say some things, and maybe it hurts some feelings, and that's okay. Uh, you'll find a way to live with it. You know, our atmosphere and hump, the hump sometimes is kind of stale. It, it is. There are sometimes you look around and people are kind of sitting on their hands, and I think that's one of the reasons we need to reposition the students. And I may be in the minority, and I, listen, I don't buy those tickets down there. Okay, so you may say, well, Steve, you're talking out of school, and maybe you're right. But when I see other basketball games on TV, to me, what makes it an incredible environment are the students. You know, the students are visible on television, uh, and you got to be well-behaved, I mean, obviously. But I, I think that when we, we reseated the hump, and uh, that happened in the previous administration, you know, maybe it was very well-intended, but I think as we begin to look forward and think about renovations, and again, I'm not part of this process, I think we've got to give the students a bigger voice at the hump. I think it's important. We talk about making it a hostile environment. We talk about making it a difficult place to play. Well, you get about, I don't know, two or 3,000 Mississippi State students in there that keep up with college basketball. They're going to be bouncing up and down and dancing and having a great time and yelling and screaming and, and making it a festive environment. To me, that's a win for us. And so, again, I have no idea what their plans are as far as when they finish the renovations, how they're going to do any of that stuff. But just last night it struck me. And, it, you know, it's one of those things, too, you get a chance to kind of sit and watch some other teams. And I have done a lot more of that here in the last month. And, and to me, the better atmospheres are the ones where the students are closer to the floor. So, students, you've got an advocate in me. I believe that you guys should be there on TV – being wild, being crazy. And, of course, don't do anything stupid. We're not going to throw anything on the floor. You know, we're not going to do anything inappropriate. But I think in order for – we talk about, you know, what do we need to do to help attendance? What do we need to do to this? And I think this is one of the things not only will, will help attendance because I think it makes it look like it's a party. Everybody wants to go have a good time. And I, I just think that the students, you know, where they are, as vocal as they are and as excitable as they can be, I think we need to have them more prominently positioned at Humphrey Coliseum. And, again, uh, I have no clue what's going to happen, but that's kind of my hope. I just I see what other people have, and I'm somewhat envious of that. And I'm just being honest. When I, I see that environment, I think, you know, that's how it used to be here. We used to have this – I mean, it was the greatest thing. I mean, like, you go look at the video, you know, when, when, uh, when Stansberry got thrown out by Carl Hess in the choke game, right? Remember that? And Ole Miss was in here, and then like Stansberry does the the um, <laughs> the symbol, and all I all I see behind them are like Mississippi State students in white t-shirts. You know, we, we had the whiteout, and them just going absolutely crazy as Rick's out there pumping his fist and going to Carl Hess, and I just think, man, where did we go wrong? How did we lose all this? And there's a lot of factors involved in all that, but I think the first step towards getting it back is is putting those students down there. And listen, I know there's a lot of people to pay a lot of money to buy basketball tickets. And so, you know, here's what I would suggest. You know, you you do what you want to with your money, but when you come to Humphrey Coliseum, uh, we need you on your feet. We need you with your fist in the air. We need you yelling. We need you to be supportive. And again, you know, you do what you want to with your money, but we're asking you, I'm asking you, on behalf of the rest of the Mississippi State fan base, when you come to the basketball game, we need you to be engaged and be a part of the game. We're not going to the movies. It's an interactive sport. So, again, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I'm just giving you that. That's my, my take on it. You may disagree, and that's okay. We can still be friends. I will still love you and respect your opinion, even if I don't agree with it. I just think we need the students down there. 
Time for today's top 10 list, brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's Close, C-L-O-S-E, with Blair, B-L-A-I-R, CloseWithBlair.com. Many of you are homeowners, and maybe perhaps you've got plenty of equity in your home, and maybe you're like, you know what, I'm just going to struggle through this. But perhaps you could consolidate some debt and lower your monthly payments, lower your debt-to-income ratio. How nice would it be to be able to, to have a little room to breathe? Or maybe you need to do some home improvements. Maybe you want to put a pool in. Maybe you want to put some new flooring in. Increase the value in your home. You reach out to my friend Blair Chandler. He's eager to be your friend too. Maybe he already is. Maybe he is. Uh, Blair is from a family of four, and um, he holds a lofty number four ranking in that family of my person. No, I'm kidding. Love Blair to death. Um, but so Blair has reached out a while back and said, hey, listen, you know, I'd like to have an incentive for uh, for Boneyard listeners, you know, people listen to the show, because hey, he wants your business. He's going to give you some incentive. He's going to pay for your appraisal. A lot of fees associated with getting a mortgage approved. It's nice to have somebody looking out for you has your back, and that's Blair. Give him a call or text today at 601-500-2344. Again, that's 601-500-2344. And if you mention to him that you heard about him on the Boneyard, he's going to offer that appraisal to you for free. That's a really cool thing. Whether you've dreamed of owning a home someday and thought that maybe perhaps that dream was not going to be a reality for you, give Blair an opportunity to help you. He, he deals with a lot of non-conforming, atypical borrowers. If there's a way to get it done, Blair Chandler can get it done. Reach out to him today. Close with Blair.com. Okay, today's top 10 list. We're going modern rock today. Thinking about doing a legendary rap group on Friday. Thinking about that, still kicking that around a little bit. Um, but today we're doing modern rock. And so there are a lot of people who say, well, Steve's kind of a one-trick pony. You're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. You want to put me in my little 80s metal box. That's cool, but uh, you're wrong. I like it all. I like some more than others. I do think, you know, the music you grow up with is, is always going to hold a special place in your heart. Uh, but so recently... There's a modern rock band that uh, you should be familiar with. If you do not know this band, you need to know this band. Maybe you've heard of them. Maybe you've seen a video on YouTube or something like that. You're like, hey, this guy's pretty good. Well, they're on their second singer, but here's the thing. Just last week, it was announced that Three Days Grace had their 16th number one Billboard hit on the mainstream rock chart. Now, there's another band out there that uh, has got about the same number, and that's a band called Shinedown you guys may be familiar with. But here's what's crazy about that, is Three Days Grace and Shinedown have surpassed Van Halen on mainstream rock number ones. And that is a record that held for like 20 years. Van Halen. And you probably say, are you kidding me, Steve? Three Days Grace has more number ones than Van Halen? Yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you. More number one on the Billboard mainstream rock charts. Uh, Three Days Grace and Shine Down. I think Shine. I think I think Three Days Grace is taking the lead, and then Shine Down's new single that's out, The Planet Zero, will probably tie them again. Uh, but it's incredible to think, you know, the people say, you know, rock is dead, and then we have, you know, bands like this that are routinely putting up number one. It's very consistent. Uh, and the thing about rock today is we don't have a lot of headliners, but we have a lot of solid bands. Three Days Grace is one of them, and so. Uh, here is your top 10 Three Days Grace songs. Let me throw a few honorable mentions out there. Let's go Pain, I Am Machine, and that's what Matt Waste is a singer. Adam Gautier was uh, the original lead singer. Uh, Riot and Misery Loves My Company. Misery Loves My Company probably should have made the list. I, I kind of jumped back and forth with that one. I think Misery Loves My Company is a great, great song. All right, so here we go, number 10, and... Um, so nine of these ten are with uh, with Adam as a singer, and then Matt has one. I do like the current Three Days Grace lineup. The new the new single is uh, So Called Life. That is number one in America right now in the mainstream rock charts. And so Matt's done a good job. Matt actually has a brother in the band. Matt used to front a band called uh, My Darkest Days. And so when Gautier left, they just brought Matt in and just can continue. And, and these guys are great songwriters, and so you would expect that to happen. I just think that Adam brought a different element. And even though I like the new version of Three Days Grace, I like the older version better. 
All right, so number 10 is Home. And I, I love this song. I think that you guys will love it too if you don't already know it. Um, it's very rock. It's it's not too heavy. It's not too light. It's got enough of the rock elements where it's got a little grunt to it, but at the same time too, it's not aggressive or angry in that respect. Uh, and there has there was some angry stuff earlier in the catalog. And, and um, that's the thing that I think about too with this band is we've seen them kind of evolve, but the fans have kind of hung in there with them. Number nine, Just Like You. That's another one that I think that you're going to dig. There's not a bad song on this list. I mean, it's like there's sometimes when I put a top 10 list together, on the back end of the list, I got to think, okay, there's a lot of songs that are kind of similarly situated. You know, we could probably do a top 20 Three Days Grace list. I mean, honestly, these guys are outstanding. I mean, they got 16 number ones, right? Number eight, and this is an interesting, there's a story behind this song. You guys know I Hate Everything About You from Ugly Kid Joe. This is not a cover of that song. This is a song that actually led to these guys getting a record deal. It's on the self-titled debut album. And when they were out shopping themselves to record labels, this was on the demo. And this is the song, became the very first single, uh, really showed that they were going to be a band that had some staying power, I think, in many respects. Because a lot of people are flashing the pan, but this song really resonated with people. I hate everything about you. Now, You'd say, well, Steve, you just said there's not so much anger. Well, there, there, there was, and then some things happened, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Number seven, the the one top ten song that would Matt waste as a singer, it's a song called Painkiller. And if I remember correctly, this is the first single with Matt as the lead singer. They have been able to continue. Now, Matt is a great singer in his own respect. I don't think that he has the same ability to elicit emotion from his listener that Adam Gauthier does. Um but they're a good radio-friendly rock band. I, I just think that there is some emotion involved with some of the earlier stuff in the catalog, which is why I like it a little bit better. Uh, Life Starts Now was the third album, and um, this is after Adam got clean and sober, and I'm going to get that on, on our next track. But uh, this is one of those songs that I think resonates with a lot of people. It's World So Cold, and... You know, I'm, I'm a person that, you know, for many of my years, I said, you know, I've never had a sad day in my life, and I just hadn't lived long enough. You know, it's like when you're young and naive and you've got this cock out optimism and you think, you know, the, the world is going to be great and everything's going to be fair and everybody's going to treat you nice if you get out and you go to work every day and you treat other people with respect and everything's going to go well for you. That's just not how life works. At least it hadn't for me. Uh, but World So Cold is one of those songs that really kind of resonates. Um, but uh, the album One X was the second album and much of this was written uh when adam was in rehab adam developed an addiction to oxycontin um and they couldn't complete the first tour i mean that, like they were hot and they were one of these great bands a lot of people wanted to have them on the road for support they had to come off the road uh, he goes into rehab and then begins to begin to to find some emotion and some feelings outside of anger and uh, things got a little more optimistic in the subsequent albums but I think this is the defining album of their catalog. I think this is when they emerged from being a kind of a support band to being a headliner for what that means in today's rock scene. But this song is about addiction and it's animal I have become. The music on this is incredible. I mean, they really matured as musicians and songwriters on this album. And this is where I think there was this turning point in the material, too. Instead of being so bitter and resentful and angry at the world, things got a little more optimistic. There was still some emotional things that they'd talked about, but uh, it wasn't so fatalist. All right, Life Starts Now also gave us the good life. Now, this opening riff gets to me. It's one of those songs like, I know where I'm at. I know what's going on. I'm excited for the ride. And that's kind of what happens. All I want is a little of the good life. And again, this is about, you know, getting sober and kind of putting some adversity behind you. I dig the track. I think you guys will too. Uh, there are times in my life that the number three song has been my favorite Three Days Grace song. It's off the album Transit of Venus. It is the fourth album in the catalog. They've got, um, let me think here for a second. What is it? Seven, seven albums now. I think they're working on their seventh. Um, but Transit of Venus, again, I thought it kind of continued the maturation of this band. 
I thought the songwriting continued to improve, and I thought there was just some authenticity with this album. And then Adam ends up leaving the band, which I think a lot of people thought Three Days Grace wouldn't be able to continue uh, without Adam. He was the primary songwriter. They have been able to continue because they are very talented musicians. Um, but the song is The High Road. I absolutely love this song. And there, there are times that I've put this song on, you know, when I've been in really a really bad place. And you just put this on, and, and it kind of reminds me in some of the things that I have gone through. And it's, you know, um, I took the low road in, I'll take the high road out. Um, it's it's a great song, and it's one of those things. There's some relationship type stuff in there. But I just think musically, this is one of those songs. Like if I was going to introduce somebody to Three Days Grace, somebody's like, hey, Steve, get me started. I'd like to know more about this band. This is probably the first song that I would give them. I would say, you know, this is this is it. I think this kind of encompasses who they are as a band. Number two, back to the 1X album, it's never too late. And again, this is, we're working through so much of these addiction issues. And so uh, Adam actually went and volunteered at treatment facilities and uh, played like an acoustic, told some of his story and played some acoustic stuff. And this is one of those songs that was uh, featured in those sets. It was, it's an important song. It's never too late. It's like you think about as long as there is breath, there is hope. And that's the thing about you know, addiction. So many people of being honest with each other and with themselves that are kind of beyond hope. And I used to think I was one of those people. Uh, but turns out that I wasn't. I just needed a good sponsor and I needed to actually work the steps and not just go in there and memorize them. But Never Too Late is a song that means a lot to me. Uh, I think that you guys will enjoy that one. If you don't know it, you need to. But number one, also off Transit of Venus, this is... Uh, you know, the idea behind this song, the premise behind the song is phenomenal. And again, it's about, you know, get, kind of getting run over by a relationship. And the name of the song is Chalk Outline. You know, you just left me dead, you killed me, you know. Look at you. You know, look what you did. Um, and so I know that there are going to be a lot of varying opinions from the Three Day, Days Grace Faithful. I know some of you will reach out and say, hey, Steve, you blew it. You should have done this one, you should have done that one. And that's okay. There are so many great songs in his catalog. I, you know, I, I think, honestly, if the lineup had not changed, and that's not in any way to be, you know, taking a shot at Matt, I think Three Days Grace would be a true headliner in rock music today. I, I think it kind of arrested their development a little bit uh, when they had to change singers, and it almost feels and sounds like a new band. Uh, if you're wondering about Adam, he's now fronting a group called St. Asonia, that uh, has a great track called Let Me Live My Life, and they did a great version of uh, Phil Collins' I Don't Care Anymore. It's great. So he's still out there doing it. I hope he's still clean and sober. But uh, you can listen to some of his pain and also uh, his recovery on this list today. That's your top ten Three Days Grey songs. If um, you have ideas for the top ten list, reach out and let me know. You can find me on all forms of social media, at Scout Steve R., these great lists are put together with you uh, for me on Spotify and Apple Music, thanks in large part to our friend Roy Samante. You can find him on Twitter and on Spotify at Dogmatic. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. And then Izzy Mandelbaum, of course, responds to, to Roy's tweets with the iTunes or Apple Music list. And so we want to get this out there for you. Hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, So many of you have shared, hey, Steve, I would like to hear this. I'd like to hear that. You guys have some creative ideas. Uh, Had some Motown interest here as of late, so maybe we'll get to some of that next week. Uh, I stand a man even said, hey, Steve, you've got some older listeners. We'd like to hear your take on this. And so what? We're going to do a list for stand a man next week. How about that? All right, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and get to our next segment of the show. Speaking of Stand a Man, brought to you by CampusBookmart.net. I was just there yesterday. Went by and bought the kid a, a national championship hoodie. We, I think he's got officially now 24 hoodies. He's got, I mean, it's like, I don't know, it's like an epidemic, man. It's like kids today. I remember when I was in high school, it's like you had a couple of hoodies and you didn't wear them that often because like people would like um, pull your hood going down the hallway. And then all of a sudden, it kind of became a theme when I was in college. And then like, oh, you shouldn't wear hoodies. And then now it's everywhere. And now there's this debate, is, is hoodie a jacket or a shirt? And so you just buy a bunch of them, you don't have to worry about it. You always got a fresh one. 
Uh, but I was in there yesterday, and, and the selection is outstanding. Now, Kathy Brown did such a great job merchandising that store and had a chance to visit with my dear friend, the lovely, talented Susie, running the show downstairs. Uh, they're eagerly, eagerly anticipating the arrival of, of Dogpile. I mean, like I get there yesterday, and all the next thing I know, we're on a conference call, and they're putting a social media plan together. We've got to promote this and do that, and we're going to hear it hard. And uh, it's been a great partnership for me. It'll be a great partnership for you, too. It's not because I'm so doggone special. They treat everybody with dignity and respect. They value your business at Campus Bookmart. If you can't make it to town to peruse their fine selections, visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And because I love you, we have a great promo code set up with them. It's BSR. That's the promo code that will get you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. And what does BSR stand for, you ask? Well, it's beautiful Steve Robertson. Campusbookmart.net, promo code BSR to get free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. Any order less than 50 bucks, absolutely incomplete. And if you're ordering one of those hoodies, you're going to need that promo code because you know what? To get good merchandise, sometimes you got to spend 50 bucks or more. But buy one for you and for yourself. It's going to be cold during baseball season, beginning part of the year. So be sure and outfit yourself, your family, in the latest in Maroon and White fashions at campusbookmart.net. All right, I had a few questions here as of late. Said, hey, Steve. What do you make of all the coaching changes at Mississippi State? Well, I'm going to take some time here together with you, and I'm going to share my take on it. And uh, it may not match yours, and that's okay. I have some mixed feelings about it, to be quite honest with you. I, I have the concern that many of you have. I mean, it's, there's some, a lot of moving parts to this. And so how does that all mesh together? So let's start with Drew Hollingshead being hired – to be the inside receivers coach. Now, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I wanted Chad Bumpus, and that's not a slight at Drew Hollingshead in any way whatsoever. And here's the deal. Many of you wanted Chad because we know Chad. We know the kind of competitor that he is. He's from Mississippi. We believe that he would have bolstered our recruiting efforts in the state of Mississippi. We don't know that, but we believe that to be the case. He was the guy, too, that would have to learn the scheme. And, you know, we've been told, it's you know, there's not a lot of uh, learning curve with that sort of stuff. And so it seemed to me that that would be, you know, a good decision. And you know what? Now it's just not the time. It's just not the time. Now, were there some efforts made to get Chad Bumpus back to Starville? There absolutely were. It just didn't work out. And that happens in life. But for the same reasons that many of you wanted Chad – are the same reasons that Mike Leach promoted Drew Hollingshead. He knows Drew Hollingshead. He knows what he has in Drew Hollingshead. And many of you, maybe we don't. And I think it's important to kind of understand this. You know, Drew Hollingshead has been in the air raid offense for more than a decade. He understands the scheme. He understands the expectations of the scheme. He knows the demands of that personnel group. And you're like, well, you know, well, Steve – Steve, he didn't, uh, he didn't play receiver. And you know what? That's true. You know, neither did Bob Tyler. Bob Tyler didn't even play college football. And if I remember correctly, neither did Bill Belichick. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Drew Hollingshead's going to be Bill Belichick. My point is, is that a guy doesn't necessarily have to play a position to coach a position. You know, Drew has mainly worked with quarterbacks. And so he understands that aspect of it, too. He understands the thought process of the quarterback, what the receivers need to do to make themselves available to the quarterback. And so he understands the nuances of the scheme. Do we have some concerns about the recruiting aspect? We absolutely do. And I think those are warranted. And I think Drew will tell you himself, hey, got to get up to speed on this. This is a difficult league to kind of cut your college coaching teeth as a recruiter. I mean, this you're swimming with the Sharks. And you've got to have a little bit of you-know-what in you, you know, when it comes to that, because you're going to be constantly on guard. We are constantly at war on the recruiting trail, especially in this state. I don't know what recruiting territory Drew's going to have. But, again, I go back to, you know, when you're in leadership. You know, I, I've been fortunate in my life to, uh, to be in charge of a lot of things. And I have hired and promoted a lot of people. I have fired a lot of people, over 100. And it's never an easy undertaking. You know, when you have to go sit somebody down and say, this is no longer going to work out for us. 
That's the reality of life. But I probably made some hiring and promotion decisions that didn't make a lot of sense to anybody but me because I had a vision. I knew what I expected. I saw the attributes and skill sets in certain individuals. I said, hey, this works for me. And in some situations, you know, I have some people like when I was in the retail furniture business, they'd have all these manager trainees come work for me because we had good culture. We were a well-rounded uh, you know, institution. We were good at customer service. We were good at sales. We were good at service. We were good at collecting our money. We were good at delivering. We were good at, we were a well-rounded store. And so I'd have these people that come in and they, they, we'd have a lot of know-it-alls that couldn't do anything. You know, it's like they, they understood the book knowledge aspect of it. They didn't understand the reality of it. And so, you know, I support the decision because I support Mike Leach. Would it have been my decision? Probably not. But I also had the benefit of having known Chad Bumpus since he was 15 years of age. I saw how well his group played in the Rose Bowl. I mean, these are guys that are probably going to be a preseason top 10 team. But the reality of it is, is that I have a different point of reference when it comes to Chad that Mike Leach does. And so, you know, we're paying that guy over $5 million a year to coach a football team. And so he's going to coach a football team. And you can say, you know, but Steve – you know, all of this rhetoric doesn't, doesn't change anything. It doesn't help anything. We And everybody is entitled to their opinion, and I encourage you to share your opinion. But I also think it's important to be respectful of Drew Hollingshead. This is a guy that's paid his dues. This is a guy that's worked his way up. And, you know, when I went and spent the evening with your football staff watching film, wrote an article about it. It was outstanding. It was a great experience. The guy running the show during film review was Drew Hollingshead. He was going through the cut-ups. He pulled them up. He had comments. You know, they were insightful. And, and you kind of get the sense, you know, this guy's not a GA. This guy's not really a QC. This is a coach in waiting. You know, I go back, you know, you, you go back several years at Texas Tech. I wonder how excited the people at Lubbock were when Mike Leach decided to elevate a GA to run his wide receivers room. A guy by the name of Lincoln Riley, maybe you've heard of him. And so I think you have to put some faith in Mike Leach's ability. That's one thing that I have noticed. There's so many people, it's like we go out, we hire Mike Leach. We do something that is very uncharacteristic of the Mississippi State experience. We go out and hire another Power 5 school's sitting head coach. We bring him in and say, okay, listen, this is your baby. It's your program. And then we, you know, again, we, we got, you know, some misgivings at times. We're like, oh, well, there's this and there's that. We need to do this. We need to do that. Listen, I'm not going to sit here and say shut up and trust the coaches. But when you've got a guy that has been in a game as long as Mike Leach, he knows what he wants in a coach. He does. And so that's a decision that he made. I support the decision. And, again, it's not, it may not be what I would have done. But I also don't have the benefit of knowing what Mike Leach knows about Drew Howling's head. I know that my experiences with Drew have been very positive. And I'm going to have concerns no matter who we hire, right? I mean, how many times do we go through this and like, hey, we need some, we need Mississippi guys on staff. We need some guys that know where Wiggins is. We need some guys that know, you know, how to get out and go travel. You know, that they know how to get up and down, you know, alternate 45. These are guys that can drive you directly to Knoxville County High School. You know, that those, you know, those things are important. We don't have a lot of that. And that was kind of what I hoped that, that Chad would bring because I felt like, you know, Chad's a guy too that not only does he know these high schools, there's not a high school in Mississippi that he's going to go into that people don't know who he is. You know, and, and that's the thing about, you know, recruiting. Recruiting's about relationships. And it's not necessarily who you know, but who knows you. And I think that's, that's an important aspect in all this stuff too. But the reality of it is this just wasn't the time. And that is in no way a criticism of Mike Leach or Chad Bumpus or Drew Howling's head for that matter. So Drew's your inside receivers coach. And then uh, we'll kind of move forward with, uh, with life. Uh, Drew, of course, coached the inside receivers during bowl practices, which was basically an audition in many respects. And, and uh, he'll have the benefit, too, of already having a working relationship with Steve Spurrier. And uh, Steve will coach the outside receivers. And so, you know, we'll see how things go. I do hold out some hope at some point that Chad does come home. Because I do think Chad is a rising coach in a profession. I do think Chad's a very intelligent, articulate person. I think it's just a matter of time uh, before he gets an opportunity to coach in the Southeastern Conference, and I certainly hope it's here at Mississippi State. Now, there are some other movement with it, too. 
you know, uh, you know, Jason Washington uh, makes the move from safeties to running backs. And then running backs coach Eric Mealy goes to coach the special teams. Now, let's talk about our perception of our team, our honest assessment of the 2021 Mississippi State team football performance. There were two, there were two groups that were consistently inconsistent. Special teams and our safeties. And our safeties for the past two years uh, have kind of struggled at times. I, I think if we're being honest with ourselves – you look at the fact that, um, you know, we have played pretty well on the corners and we played really well at linebacker, but uh, not necessarily uh, as good with the pass rush this year, a little bit better last year, and, and not necessarily as good over the top. And, and so you have needs at those personnel groups. Well, Mike Leach assesses them, and then Mike Leach addresses those issues. Eric Mealy is a guy that's been a special teams coach multiple times, including for Mike Leach. He understands the expectations that Mike Leach has on that personnel group. Jason Washington's a guy that's been a good recruiter for us. Hadn't been a great recruiter, but he's been a good recruiter for us. I mean, Marcus Banks and Jalen Green are not here without Jason Washington being on your staff. And so you keep Jason as a recruiter, you move him to running backs. Do I have some concerns about him coaching running backs? Having never done it on a college level, well, of course I do. I think that those, you know, those questions are, you know, are well noted. But the reality of it is, is you know, you're bringing a guy in too, and now you've got some people around him that um, they kind of understand what's expected of those positions. And I think also too, it helps to have a couple of guys like Dylan Johnson and Woody Marks that understand the expectations already placed upon them in this scheme. And so if you're going to do that, if you're going to experiment a little bit, it helps to have a veteran group. Whereas if you had Jason Washington, a guy come in that's never really coached running backs, and then you've got a bunch of young guys and he's you know there to kind of lay the foundation, you might have some, some bigger concerns. But Jason Washington is a football coach. Jason Washington is a very intelligent guy. I don't think it's going to be a situation where the running backs are going to take a step backwards. I, I just don't believe that. Now, ideally – Kind of your tight ends coach and your running backs coach on offense are traditionally your recruiters. Those are guys that uh, their primary focus is to recruit. And so I think in some respects, you know, maybe this frees up Jay Wash uh, to be an even more prolific recruiter for us. And again, I think he's been good. I don't think he's been great. Uh, but I like Jason Washington. I think Jason's a great communicator. Uh, and I'm glad that he's still on the staff. Now, on defense, outside of the defensive line, You've got a lot of shifting going on out there. Matt Brock now, who has coached special teams in the Sam Backers, is going to coach all the linebackers. And he wanted a more prominent role on the defensive side. Now he has it. He also is no longer saddled with the responsibility of coaching special teams. Two years ago, we were much better in special teams. Last year, we were dreadful. So you've got an issue. You fix the issue. But Matt Brock is a very good recruiter, one of the best recruiters on our staff. I would submit to you probably the best recruiter defensively on Mike Leach's staff. The guy's a great evaluator. The guy goes out and gets it done. I mean, he gets Khalid Moore in the boat early on, and people – you know, if Khalid Moore had waited to sign in December, you'd be beside yourselves with glee. But he gets him in the boat early. So I have a lot of confidence in Matt Brock as a linebacker coach. I have a lot of confidence, especially as a recruiter. Well, now you've got – Zach Arnett coaching the safeties. You know, Zach's the guy, too, that played linebacker, so it made a lot of sense that he coached linebacker. Now he's going to coach the safeties. But, again, now, so now you have the guy that knows your scheme the best, addressing his weakest unit in some respects. So you got the best guy working on the biggest problem. Zach knows what he needs those guys to do. And at times we get out of position last year. At times we didn't play the football very well. So Zach will address that. So Jeff Phelps, unmoved. Tony Hughes, unmoved. But we've made some changes. We'll see how it works. I mean, nobody knows for sure. But I think at some point you got to put some faith in the fact that, uh, you know, Mike Leach has won a lot of football games. Mike Leach knows what he expects. He also gives his defensive coaches a little more autonomy than a lot of other coaches do. And so at the end of the day, you have one coach leave – you replace that guy from within, the guy that knows your culture, knows what Mississippi State is about, understands what Mike Leach wants, 
and then you, you you reshuffle some guys around. But the reality of it is, if you look at most of these guys' resumes, they've 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 done a lot of things. You know, Mason Miller, your offensive line coach, that is now the run game coordinator too. Uh, we don't run it much anyway. You know, um, you know the bottom line is that he didn't play. He didn't play offensive line in college either. He was a running back, fullback. He's coaching the offensive line. And the group's been pretty good. You know, they, they took a step forward this year. You know, last year was a much different year. I don't know if you can really judge anybody based on what happened in 2020. You know, a lot of that contact tracing really impacted offensive line play in 2020. They got better as the year went on, and I thought they were better last year. You know, there were times, obviously, that we didn't uh, – execute at the level that we wanted to at certain positions. But the reality of it is they were better last year. You know, I don't think Nick Saban ever coached quarterbacks either. Guys got some pretty good ones over the years, right? You know, and so I I say all that to say that, you know, you've got some guys out here that know the game of football. They understand recruiting at the Power 5 level, and you've moved them around. And we'll see how it works. I can't sit here and tell you, oh, it's going to be a home run. It's going to be – you know, an absolute best thing that's ever happened. But what I do respect and admire is, number one, loyalty to Drew Howling's head. I can respect it. And this is a guy that has patiently waited his turn. He's paid his dues. Now he's getting his opportunity. And then on the defensive side of the football, you know, you had some some issues. And so now you, you, you shuffle some guys around to try and address those issues. And, you know, Zach Garnett is a hard-nosed blue-collar coach. And I, my hope is that personnel group will kind of take on more of his personality. You know, we especially on the back end, we need some dog in us. We need that Ashley Cooper, Nico Whitley, Jonathan Abram type reputation. We've talked about it on the show before. We need people to fear crossing the face of the Mississippi State safeties. We need guys that are going to be very physical at the point of attack, we need people that are going to have an identity that basically shows that we are a team that you better be careful of, that we will absolutely get after you. And I think Zach Arnett does that. Now, they say, well, Steve, you know, Zach didn't play safety. No, he didn't. He didn't. But the guy's your defensive coordinator. You know, he's your X's and O's guy. He knows what those guys are, you know, their responsibilities are within the scheme of the defense. And let's also be honest with ourselves, too. We don't really know what's going on in these coaching meetings the last two years. We don't know what those film review sessions have been like. We don't know what Zach Arnett has addressed, what Mike Leach has addressed. We don't know. All we know is what we see on the field and then what we see in the press conferences. And so, you know, we don't have any choice but to support it. Um, But, you know, the reality of it is is that, you know, we have hired a football coach that has won uh, basically everywhere he's ever been and and won at a pretty high level. And I think you've got to – play some faith in his experience and say, you know what? Hey, this may not have been what I would have done, but this guy's won an awful lot more football games than I have. And so Mike Leach on that offensive side of the football, you know, they basically brought the off the offensive staff from Washington state intact. Drew was part of that. He was kind of that next man up mentality. It was kind of understood that at some point he would have the opportunity to be on the field in the Mike Leach air raid offense. He's learned. And will there be a learning curve? There absolutely will be in all aspects. I mean, that, that, that's kind of how it's to be expected. You know, it's like people say, well, you know, I don't want to go get a retread or I don't want to go get this or God, it's long in the tooth. And, you know, we don't want a greenhorn either, you know, and, and, I, and I get that too. But whenever Mike Leach starts conducting an opinion poll to determine who he should hire and promote, it's probably the time we need to move on. No leader makes any decisions based on opinion polls. Maybe your political candidates do, but that's just not reality in life. You got to go out there and do what you believe is right. You got to stick to your guns, make your own decisions, because at the end of the day, it's your responsibility. You know, there's no point in us even having leadership if we're just going to let the fans pick. Oh, uh, let's just go put out a Twitter poll and say, okay, well, what should, what place should we run? What are we going to do here? You know, sometimes, you know, that's the thing, too. I, I, one of the things I love about social media is that anybody can use it. And the thing I hate the most about it is that anybody can use it. And one of the things it's done is it's allowed a lot of people with uninformed opinions uh, to have a platform to share those uninformed opinions. And the next thing you know, 
uh, we have this new cult of personality. It's like, oh, well, I agree with that. I don't know what's really going on. I don't have the facts, but I like this person, so I'm going to agree with them. And because that's kind of how I feel or whatever. And then, you know, then next thing you know, we've got the blind leading the blind. We don't know, you know, and the reality of it is, is, you know, Mike Leach uh, hasn't had a lot to say on the matter. We'll speak with him today. We'll ask him about some of these issues and uh, kind of why, you know, what his thought process was like. And, you know, I don't think Leach has uh, has ever been one that's been shy about sharing, you know, what he thinks and and what he feels about things. But um, again, I support the decision. And again, it may, may have not been what I wanted to do, but Michael Leach didn't pick up the phone one day and say, hey, Steve, we're, we're getting ready to hire an inside receivers coach. Who do you like? I mean, that, that conversation never happened. You know, he's never you know, called me and asked my opinion of things and said, hey, what do you think I should do? And I wouldn't want a football coach like that. I, I wouldn't. I would not want a person that uh, doesn't have confidence in their own decision-making abilities. And that's Mike Leach for sure. That guy believes in what he's doing believes that he knows the, the, the better way to get things done. And so the reality of it is is that he has uh, promoted his guy on his offense, on his program at our university. You know, I mean, how many times last year, you know, kind of switching gears a little bit with you guys, and we're going to get into some baseball stuff before we get out of here, but how many, how many posts last year that I see on social media, people complaining about Chris Lamona sitting on a bucket uh, during a baseball game, and you're like, I just wish he would do something or say something. And all you see is like, you know, a little three second clip that the SEC network cameras catch, and you think you've got an idea of what's going on. And the guy goes on to win an AFL championship. It's like, we don't know. We just see this, you know, this little sound bite or this little video clip, and we think we know. But we don't know. It's the same thing across the board. And so, you know, I I look at this stuff. There are a lot of these popular opinion makers on social media and the message board culture that a lot of people have some some trust in their take on things and their knowledge of the situation is just as limited as the readership. You know, they, they just maybe have a more articulate way of expressing it and maybe it resonates with them. It's like, well, yeah, I feel that way too. You know, but you may be wrong. I mean, have we ever considered a possibility that we may not know and there's a reason that we don't know and that it's okay that we don't know? But at the end of the day, it's Mike Leach's job to go win football games. It's Mike Leach's job to put a competitive product on the field. And we've got a a pretty challenging schedule next year, but I I expect this program to continue to mature right along with Will Rogers. Got a lot of players, obviously, that now have a couple of years in the system that you know should be ready to take another nice jump. You know, we've got some uh, obviously some needs to address, but you know, what would you think of Mike Leach had he just stuck with the status quo? I mean, how many times did we go through this last year? Man, special teams has got to change. Many of you were calling for Matt Brock's head, and so. If we had just said, hey, we're just going to run with what we have and hope for the best next year, you'd be incensed. And now you've got the guy out there addressing your concerns, which are the same concerns that he has, and he's making some moves to alleviate the problems that we had at those positions. And I think in some respects, whether you may agree with his moves or not, you have to give the guy some, you know, some credit for recognizing a need and making moves uh, to shore up a weakness there. So – uh, those are my thoughts about it. Again, you may may disagree. That doesn't change how I feel about you. I hope it doesn't change the way you feel about me. Uh, but the reality of it is is that uh, we're all kind of along for the ride here. We all have varying opinions. But at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, and that's for Mississippi State to be successful. And I'll be rooting for Drew Howling's head. I will be rooting for Drew Howling's head. Because if Drew is successful, then that means our offense has been successful, which means that our football program is winning ball games and being successful. That's the truth of the matter. I support every coach at Mississippi State until they are no longer the coach here at Mississippi State. And that includes Ben Howland, too. Even though I have had some issues with a lot of things that he's done, at the end of the day, I want Mississippi State to be successful regardless of who the coach is. You know, I don't need somebody to take me out to dinner or bring me to play golf or whatever for me to like them. You know, they, they want my approval. Just win. That, that's as simple as I can make it. If you win, chances are that I'm going to really like you uh, as a coach, no matter the sport, because that's what it's about. This is not the Boy Scouts. We, you know, we're not selling Amway here. It's not a situation where we're all going to get together and have a drink 
and uh, I want you to be my doubles pool partner. That's not the case at all. You know, the whole, the whole point of these people being in our lives is the fact that they coach this, the athletic programs that we cheer for. And so in order for that relationship to work and to be longstanding, you got to win. The rest of it really doesn't matter. It's as simple as that. Let's thank our good friend Brooks Bryan and that fine group of people involved with Portico. What a great residential development. If you're looking to move to Starkville, and you should, there is no doubt about it. You absolutely should. Whether it be your primary residence or second home, maybe, you, maybe you're thinking of retiring and say, you know what, Steve, we're going to you know, kind of move the, the, the farm up there to, uh, to Starkville. That way we'll be close, and we'll be able to go to the ball games. We'll be able to have you know, more informed opinions. We'll be able to just say, hey, this is what we'll do. It's, there's a life here, and, and we've talked about that recently. We've had a lot of retirees that have come. They, they've retired and you know, bought a place here in town, and they just kind of lived the Mississippi State experience. Oh, well, the, the women are playing Sunday. Well, then the men are playing on Tuesday. The women are back in action on Thursday. Oh, we got a midweek baseball game Wednesday. And so it's like this is what they've become. This is what life is is we go pull for the Bulldogs. And so if you're one of those people, if you're true Maroon, and you'd like to be a part of our culture here in Star Vegas, and I, I, I hope you will, uh, give our friend Brooks Bryan a call, 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075. What is Portico? Well, it's the newest, nicest development on the campus out of Stark Vegas. 1.1 miles from the Mississippi State campus, very easy access to 82 and 25, and 12 for that matter. Very easy to find. You turn off 82 on a 12. The very first ride is Pat Station Road. That takes you to your new home at Portico. And you're on the right side of campus. You're on the quiet side of campus. So you have the convenience of campus without the hustle and bustle of campus. You can start with up to a two-bedroom, two-bath home, up to a four-bedroom, four-bath home. And here's the thing. Phase one completely sold out. Phase two now, getting that bad boy underway, you can have a say in picking out your lot and your house plans. That's a really cool thing right there. Have some decision-making process when you think about your new home. Be sure and check them out today. Again, that's Portico. Make it your next move. All right, we had Mississippi State Baseball Media Day yesterday, and uh, I always enjoy that, you know, because hope springs eternal. And so this time last year, we had to do the media day on a Zoom call. I had a one-on-one interview with Logan Tanner last year, and he told me, he goes, hey, our goal is to be the last team to win. We want to be the last team standing. We want to be the last team to win a game. That's exactly what happened. And I asked him about that in Omaha. It's like, how does it feel to fulfill that, that goal and that dream? And you could just see the grin on his face. Like, I think he was impressed that I remembered that. But he did say that. Now, this year, of course, we get to do it in person. Now, Logan has not scrimmaged much as of late, nor does he really need to. You know, we kind of know what we've got. So, you know, he, he jammed up, uh, I guess, an ankle back during fall baseball they've been careful with him in the spring because it doesn't matter what he does in the january and february scrimmages that i mean that that doesn't get us any closer to omaha it's what he does at dirty noble field against long beach state Uh, so we spoke to him yesterday looks to be in great shape one thing that i've always you know kind of worried a little bit about him you know when he got here he still had some baby fat on him and i thought you know hey this is a guy that uh we probably got to watch him a little bit dietary wise because you want him to have the, the strength, but at the same time too, uh, you don't want him to be a guy that gets too heavy that he can't move behind the plate. The guy looks great. He looks like a future first rounder, and that's the thing. Playing a premium position like catcher, and the fact that you're not just a defensive first player, you're going to get a lot of attention from scouts. But the, the intangibles, I think, are what really sell Logan Tanner. This is a guy that's a winner. He's a leader. We, we, people have wondered, well, what, what, what's going to happen now without T.A.? Well, Logan Tanner is the same kind of leader. Same kind of leader. Now, does he have the same credibility in the locker room? That kind of remains to be seen, but I'm, I'm going to say so, yeah. You know, but T.A.'s a guy, if we'd have been around a little bit longer, but um, they're cut from the same cloth. They're winners, but they're not just rah-rah guys. Like, they're guys that will come up late in ball games and get the big hit to win a game. I mean, look at what LT did out at Omaha. You know, we're, we're playing against Texas, and they've got a lead. What does he do? He hits a big chopper over third that uh, kind of gives State some command in the ballgame. But uh, there is some leadership qualities with him that I think you guys 
uh, are probably kind of covered in a little bit. You're like, I just need to know that there's some guys that are going to stand up in the locker room and their voice carries some weight. LT is that guy. Luke is like that too. We had a chance to visit with Luke, and I know the big question many of you guys have is, uh, is he going to keep Hardy's uh, no place like hometown is his walk up? And he tells me he is. There's, yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, Luke is a guy too, and we forget this, you know, because we won the national championship. Isn't that crazy? We won the NAFL championship. We, we basically remember that uh, he started the year as a DH and a second catcher. And then we had so many issues at first. We had to find a way to get him on the field. If we wanted to be more offensive, too, we wanted to be able to get a better, a couple more bats in the lineup. And so by moving Luke to first, that frees up a DH spot. Well, then we had some struggles defensively, right? And so, you know, Cam was having some trouble at shortstop. So we wanted to find a way – to be better defensively, but keep Cam James bat in the order. So what do we do? You know, we uh, we put him in a DH spot. Well, then we eventually move him back to third and put Forsythe in the game at short. And then the next thing you know, you got a big guy named Kellum Clark at your DH. And so we've used that spot. But the thing about Luke is he basically is a baseball player. He can kind of plug and play where you need him. But – you need a dependable glove. You need a guy at first base that has a high baseball IQ. That's what you got, Luke Hancock. And people forget this guy's been committed to us forever and a day. The guy's been a Bulldog his whole life. It was his dream to come here and play. And he's the guy, too, that just tells you I'm a lot more comfortable over there. And you know, I mentioned the South Carolina game last year. You know, we, we're that Sunday game, we're trying to get out of there with a sweep. And we make a throw over there to first, and he muffs it extends the inning, and then we go right back to to Lane, and then Lane throws the ball away. We extend the inning. They come back around, and, and uh, we ultimately lose the ball game. You know, we make either one of those plays. It's a sweep at South Carolina. But talking to uh, Chris Lamonis, he's like, you know, Luke was ready to strangle somebody, you know, when all that happened. Because he's so hard on himself. He has high expectations for himself. Now, talking to Lim and talking to Luke, you get the sense that he's – relaxed a little more. He's not playing so uptight over there. He's more comfortable. Think about that for a second. You take a guy that's not played first base, and then you roll him out there and start him playing in a Southeastern Conference. And there were some struggles early on. It was unfamiliar to him. And then he does what the team needs, and ultimately we win the NAFL championship. And I mentioned that, too, about all the, the great moves Lamontis made last year. If you go back, and I wrote about this in Dogpile. You go back and you think about all the guys that started that opening weekend in Texas that weren't in the lineup in Omaha. I mean, how many coaches kind of get stubborn and say, nope, we're just going to stick with this? Chris was willing to make the decisions. And that's been kind of his trademark here. I mean, you remember we, you know, we go out and we get Gunner, and, uh, you know, Gunner was supposed to be this great offensive player for us. And he ends up, we, you know, play him at, at second. The middle infield never came together. He and Westberg can never get together. We had Foskey over at third. We end up flipping that and putting Foskey at second. Next thing you know, we have one of the better middle infields in the country. You know, we tried Gunner at third. That didn't work out. We eventually put Marshall Gilbert there. And then what do you know? We go to Omaha and it's Marshall Gilbert getting a big walk-off hit against Auburn. You know, and, and that's the thing, too. We have had some good third basemen in our in our tenure here at Mississippi State um, as baseball stewards. But, you know, we, we have also had some times where we've had to kind of figure our way out of it but you know Chris has been one of those guys that's not afraid to move guys around for the betterment of the team and sometimes it hurts people's feelings but this is the SEC we are competing at a national championship level and so that's part of the process that's just kind of how part of things work and I commend Chris for being willing to say you know what I got to make a move here like we did with the rotation last year Right? I mean, you know, hey, we, 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 the opening weekend, we were without two pitchers, without Sarantola and Bednar, and Christian McLeod had a really good outing against Texas. And then, you know, we kind of pieced it together and have a winning weekend. Little did we know we were ultimately going to be a NAFL championship team at the time. But I think we kind of figured out, hey, well, this team's got a chance to be pretty good. The rotation is still not set. We've still got two more weekends to kind of work through all that stuff. We know Landon Sims is going to be on Friday. That's what we know. And then we know that Cade Smith and Jackson Fristo and Preston Johnson, um, Andrew Walling, and others are in the mix for the other two spots. And you would say, well, you know, he's just speaking to the team in the media. No, he's not. I've spoken with people privately and said, you know what, hey, this is, this is going to be a work in progress. 
And as Chris mentioned yesterday, we might half up some games, have one guy go four innings, let another guy go four innings, um, until we can get it set for SEC play. That's a mark of a good coach, too. It's like, hey, let's, let's promote competition and give these guys a chance to go earn and take the spot. And if you're a competitor, that's all you want. Hey, just give me my four innings, and then next week you're going to want to give me five, and then six, and then I'm going to be your guy. I mean, look at what Houston Harding did last year at Mississippi State. Houston Harding was a guy that I saw play in the summer over at Meridian at the uh, for the love of the game deal that Greg Sykes and him put on there at East Coast Sox. And Houston was outstanding. He was spotting up his change up, and he threw you know, multiple variations of the change. Never did I think in a million years that when we were getting ready to save off elimination in the Super Regional and at Omaha, we're sending Houston Harding from Itawama Community College, a guy that had no offers out of high school, to the mound to help us win a national championship. And again, this is Chris and Fox not being too stubborn and stuck in their ways, saying, you know what, hey, let's – Keep trying, guys, until we find something that works. I th- honestly, I think you have better options starting weekend-wise now than you did last year. And you say, but, Steve, we, we knew what we had in Christian McLeod. We, we thought we knew what we had with Bednar. Sarantola is the only one we were really unsure about. And, of course, it ultimately didn't work out. But I think you have probably a little better consistency when you think about the guys that are competing for those jobs. It's amazing to think, and and I say this with as much love and admiration in my heart as I can, down the stretch, we had one and a half starting pitchers. We had Will Bednar, and then everybody else kind of comprised a half, and then we kind of pieced it together in the bullpen. You know, this year is different. Cade Smith, go look at what he did at Omaha. The guy's outstanding. He was hurt early part of the year last year. I've got high hopes for him. He was the guy we were worried about losing to the draft, but they had that abbreviated draft, so ultimately he comes to school. You know, Jackson Fristo is a guy the Major League Scouts love. We just got to, you know, be a little more consistent as a strike thrower. He's got electric stuff. Can he land that breaking ball? Can he consistently throw, you know, his fastball down in his own, but not too down in his own? You know, can we eliminate the walks? You know, Andrew Walling's a guy that really struggled in the fall, but has been electric so far in the spring. You know, so – you know, that's a guy, too. You begin to think about the pieces that come together. And we last year we talked about, oh, we've got all this depth, we've got all this depth. You know, I don't know that we have the same number of players, but to be quite honest with you, I think we actually have, you know, probably better resources to pull from pitching. It's just going to be a matter of Scott to kind of define these roles. You know, my biggest concern is who is going to handle the back end. You know, Preston's in the mix, you know, for a weekend job. But, you know, Preston's one of those kind of guys, too. If he's got to be the first guy to bullpen, that's cool, too. You kind of get that, that sense from a lot of these guys. And that's the thing as a coach, you go win an AFL championship, it's a lot easier to get people to do what you want them to do. Just listen to me. You know, we'll get this, this thing handled. But uh, I like what we heard yesterday. And, again, you know, Cam James, Luke, Logan, the, the Landon, the notables. We even had Parker Stinnett, uh, who has cut his hair, which I'm not a big fan of that at all. Uh, but, you know, he's the guy, too, that's going to factor in as well. And one of the things that I consistently hear about him is that his bullpens – have been much better from a control standpoint. You know, he's the guy that has an incredible breaking ball. Call it a hammer curve, if you will. But he hadn't always been consistently able to throw it for strikes. That appears to be changing. And sometimes you got to, you, you want to throw that breaking ball out of the zone to get a swing and miss. And he's good at that. But in order to consistently get the swing and miss every so often, you got to drop that breaking ball in for a strike. And I don't care how much you know about baseball, this is the truth right here. When it comes to pitching, I don't care if it's at the high school level, uh, the college level, the pro level. When you can land your breaking ball for a strike, that's a key to the kingdom. Because if not, you're never going to be able to keep people off your fastball. So, But if you can spot up that breaking ball for a strike, you can get some swing and miss and sometimes get some calls looking, then all of a sudden your fastball feels like it's got a little more life to it. People can't sit dead red when they have to respect the breaking ball. And that's where I think Parker Stinnett is. If he becomes that guy that can consistently land that breaking ball for a strike, that's going to be a huge, huge, huge development for the Mississippi State relief efforts. It absolutely is. And he's also kind of looking to add a change. I mean, I kind of like that too. You know, you got to be able to change speed from today's game. It's going to be a very offensive league this year. And so the team that actually can pitch it a little bit is going to have a really good chance of winning the West and probably ultimately the SEC. You know, not that that means as much to us as it once did. I mean, we want to be a top eight national seed, even if we're runners up in the league, right? But the reality of it is, 
is it is going to be a very offensive league. And so the teams, like Mississippi State, they're going to be very offensive. If we can be good or really good pitching, we've got a chance to play baseball for a long time again this year. Look for all that baseball-related content on uh, jeanspage.com. A lot of that stuff will be free. And uh, we'll have full coverage of uh, Mississippi State's two, two football signees today over at jeanspage.com. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way you make more friends and enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live. What's the big deal, deal? Where can you get pizza, bread twists, specialty chicken, and more for just five ninety nine dollars each? Is it at Domino's? He hands off hand toss pizza and a marble cookie brownie. He's going, going, go! There's a lot of variety on the radio and at Domino's too, where you can. Mix and match two or more. Two item minimum pan pizza, bone and wings, and bread bowls will be extra. Ask for this limited time offer. Prices, participation, delivery area, and charges may vary.